This morning we are in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1 to 11, and uh, we're going to dial in verses 3 and 4. That's going to be where we pretty much land today. The Bible says in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in all Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now if we're afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Father, we love you. God, we're thankful for your word today. You're an amazing God. You're a mighty God. Lord, you're magnificent. You're great. And you are worthy today. This is our confession. Father, we want to be city set on a hill. We want to be bright shining lights. Lord, we want you to to effuse your glory through our lives. And so teach us, we pray. God, instruct us. Lead us on that path where your greatness is displayed, displayed, disclosed, and declared for all to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're beginning uh, this verse-by-verse study in 2 Corinthians, and the theme of it, it just, you know, if you're interested in themes, the theme is big God. You know, let me say it a different way. The theme is making God big. Now, when I say making God big. I'm not talking about affecting his characteristics or his attributes. Uh, He is the unchanging God. He's immutable. And nothing that we do can affect or change his qualities or his characteristics. I'm certainly not talking about making him big physically. I mean, there's nothing bigger than God, even physically. You know, um, LeBron James can palm a basketball. The Bible says that God can palm the universe. The very universe spans his hand. That's a big God. Do you have a big God today? Do you worship a big God? When I say we're making God big, I'm talking about him being magnified. I'm talking about his greatness being known through our lives. We live in a fallen world where Satan is ruling, where man is sinning, but where God is redeeming. We are the agents, we are God's agents of redemption, and that means that He should be shining through our lives. Uh, When we got our house over in Mountain's Edge, uh, I heard in my mind real estate agents that I've known through the years say to me, in Vegas, you do not want to buy a house facing east or west because, you know, when the sun is blazing hot in the summer, you're going to be heating up a good majority of your home. So this is what we did. We bought a house that was facing west, you know, just ignored completely the advice. And I love it because every morning we have the opportunity to wake up to see the sunrise. And I go downstairs, you know, the curtains are pulled back, the blinds are opened up. And you guys know how this works in Vegas. The sun just pours through the window. This is what we're supposed to be. When we talk about making God big or we talk about having a big God, we're talking about being a window through which the glory of God can shine. 
We're talking about in our lives, pulling the curtain back, opening up the blinds, cleansing anything that would obscure his greatness so that people around us can see that we serve a God like no other. Now, this is our journey for the next six months uh, or so as we work our way through this epistle. We're going to be on this journey together. Um, and, and my prayer is that in your life individually, this is what God does, that he is bigger and bigger. He's more and more magnified through your life as a believer in Jesus Christ. My prayer for our church is that God is made big in this ministry. And you know, there's a number of things that we're going to be embarking on, a number of steps of faith that are going to be big steps of faith for us. But God is laying the foundation in his word that he is a big God. Do you have a big God today? Do you serve a big God, a mighty God, a magnificent God? I want this to be our lingo. I want over the next six months for us to have this with, within our lingo, our vernacular, big God. Someone comes to you, a brother or sister in Christ, says, you know what, I'm struggling. I don't have enough money to meet my financial needs. Big God. That's what you're going to say back to him. Big God. That's all you have to say. Someone's struggling with a chronic or acute health issue. You say back to them, big God. Somebody is endeavoring in a ministry opportunity beyond themselves, stepping out into the unknown. I want it to be part of our vernacular that we say to them, big God, we need to be reminded that our God is a big God and with him we can do all things. We're actually changing the name of our church to Calvary Chapel Big God. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. But that would be cool, wouldn't it? Don't you want people to look at this ministry and say, you know what, those people serve a big God. That's going to happen. We're going to have to take big steps of faith. And we're going to see this, I think, as we're on a journey through 2 Corinthians. This really is a theme uh, that Paul nails down as he's inspired by the Spirit of God. We're going to see it in ministries that we have a big God. We're going to see in relationships that we have a big God. We're going to see in life and then also in death that we have a big God. We're going to see in giving that we have a big God. But as Paul embarks upon this theme, he handles the most difficult issue first. Now, I like this about the Apostle Paul. I'm kind of that guy. When somebody comes to me and says, hey, do you want the good news or the bad news first? I'm always like, give me the bad news first. Give me the hard thing to work on because the easy thing will, that, will be that much more enjoyable. Paul deals with the hardest thing first. He deals with us having a big God in the midst of our pain and suffering. In fact, as you're reading the New King James Version, he uses the word tribulation. In other translations, uh, that you may be reading this morning, you may see the word trouble or affliction. Paul is talking about pressure or stress or pain. And he starts here for a reason, because if you and I can be a window through which the magnificence, the glory, the greatness of God is poured through in suffering, when we're struggling, when we're afflicted, when the pressure is great, if we can be that then, then we can be it at any time. So Paul lays out his own personal example. And you guys, as we briefly brushed over verses 8 to 11, uh, this is basically what he is saying to this church. He, he starts with the issue of tribulation and trial, affliction, suffering, how God comforted him and how God used the trials in his life and the comfort to bless the people at Corinth. He uses his own personal example. In, in fact, Paul, as you're reading verses 8 to 11, you see that Paul is referring to a time where things were so difficult, it was so challenging, there was so much affliction that they even began to despair of life. Paul thought it, the, 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 the trial was so hard, Paul thought that they were going to die. And so they just began to trust in the God who raises the dead back to life. He learned his confidence was in the Lord. Some commentators believe that Paul is referring to a time of great suffering when he was, when he was in Asia Minor or modern-day Turkey. Maybe when he was stoned to death and dragged outside of the city and then got back up and preached the gospel. Some say it when, was when he was beaten and thrown into prison. Some say that it was during a time where he was forsaken. Paul endured a lot of affliction and suffering for the kingdom of God, 
And here he says it wasn't just for the kingdom in a general sense, it was for this church. And you know, Paul's relationship with this church was a very tenuous relationship. We just finished uh, the epistle to the church at Philippi a couple of months ago, and we talked about how sweet that relationship was, how Paul was so blessed, and they supported him in his ministry. Very different experience with the church at Corinth. You remember that Paul planted this church on his second missionary trip? He had been in Athens. He was going toe-to-toe with the philosophers of the day, the Epicureans and the Stoics. He preached the resurrection. And then he left Athens and he made his way down by foot to the city of Corinth, a very sophisticated city, a city that was in vogue, a city that was known worldwide for its decadence. Every single god and goddess was worshipped in the city of Corinth. And it was there, Paul relates this in 1 Corinthians, it was there that he came with, with a weakness, he was trembling as he preached, but he determined in his heart to preach nothing but Christ in him crucified. And some commentators say Paul was very specific about the crucifixion of Christ because it was something that was left out of his message when he was in Athens. And as you look back at Paul's message in Athens to the philosophers of the day, he did talk about the resurrection. He did not talk about the crucifixion. And it's interesting, it's the only place where Paul ministered that a church plant was not started. So it's possible. It's possible that the Apostle Paul wanted to make sure that every variable of the gospel was included in his message. And so he preached uh, without uh, mitigation. He did not resist at all in preaching the crucifixion and the resurrection. There was a lot of affliction there. He suffered persecution, but he stayed there for about a year and a half. And then he made his way back to Jerusalem. On his way back, he was in Ephesus. And while he was in an in Ephesus, he heard that the church at Corinth was not doing very well. Now, listen, I don't want to labor points today, but I want you to understand a little bit about Paul's relationship with this church. Paul, we know, historically wrote four letters to this church. How many do we have in the Bible? We have two. So we have letter number two, and we have letter number four. Letter number two is 1 Corinthians. Letter number four is 2 Corinthians. And this is how it worked. Paul heard there was immorality in the church, and so he wrote them a letter correcting them. Um, as that letter was taken to the church, uh, they wrote a letter back to the Apostle Paul asking some questions. There were other problems in the church. So Paul wrote another letter back, the second letter. That's 1 Corinthians. And as you go through 1 Corinthians, it's, you, can, you get the idea that he's answering questions. There were issues of immorality. There was a specific issue happening in the church that church leadership was not dealing with, and Paul addressed that very directly. There were brothers and sisters in the church suing each other. Uh, there were issues concerning the resurrection and the belief in the resurrection. The use of spiritual gifts was totally out of control. So Paul writes the second letter, 1 Corinthians, to address those questions. As that letter gets to that church, there's a group of people called Judaizers that hijack the church in Corinth. They're Judaizers, they're legalistic, they doubt Paul's apostolic authority, they hijack the church for themselves, and they won't allow any letter of Paul's to be read in the ministry. In fact, Paul was so concerned about this, he left Ephesus and he made a short trip to Corinth and he was totally rebuffed by these leaders and by the church. They wouldn't even let him speak. So he goes back to Ephesus and he writes, we'll see this later in this letter, he writes what he calls a severe letter, a, le a letter of rebuke. That's letter number three. Now that letter is delivered by Titus and during this time Paul is very concerned, he's very worried about the condition of this church and you know probably some personal pain involved as well. Can you imagine planting a church and then being rebuked or rebuffed by the people that you've led to the Lord? Pretty heavy situation. Titus is on his way back with word. Paul can't wait because he's so concerned about them. He meets Titus, most people believe in Macedonia, maybe in Philippi, and Titus has good news. They've booted those bad guys out, they've corrected the moral issues in the church, and they're through this letter to Paul expressing how much they love him. Paul writes letter number four, which is 2 Corinthians. And so you get the idea, there's a sense of relief 
Uh, there's a sense of joy in Paul's heart. There's this theme of how big God is. But when Paul's talking about his own personal suffering, it, it includes all of that. You know, we love uh, the Apostle Paul for a lot of different reasons. One reason I love him and I love the story of his life is that his life was a window through which the glory and the magnificence of God poured forth. And oftentimes, it was in the midst of suffering. So let me ask you a question today. When you're suffering, when you're in pain, when there's tribulation and trial, is the glory of God pouring through your life? Is the magnificence of God on display for everybody around you to see? Now, we're going to see a couple of things today. Maybe the answer to that question is no. Maybe the answer to that question is I'm not sure. Maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, I sure would, be, I sure would love to be equipped for that. I want you to notice four things I think that will equip us to be windows for the glory of God. Verse 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul was able to be a window, number one. Paul magnified God, number one. Paul had a big God, number one, because he was faithful to bless God. It all begins with blessing God. The point is praise in the midst of pain. God will never be made big until I get my eyes off of my pain. God will never be made big in your life until you get your eyes off of your own pain. Pain is seductive. You know how it works. When you're going through pain, there is, it's, it's almost like it is compelling you. It seems or it feels like it is compelling you to turn inward. And as you begin to turn inward, that seductiveness of pain almost makes you want to stay in that place. You know, uh, have you ever been putting a nail in the wall maybe to hang a picture or uh, a, a piece of artwork, and as you're nailing away, you miss the nail and hit your thumb. Has that ever happened to you before? Okay, raise your hand just so I don't feel like the only idiot in this place today. All right, great. God bless you all. Let's just raise our thumbs this morning. This was the one I heard. So you guys know what it's like. You're hammering away, boom, 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 and then, you know, someone calls your name. You miss the nail, you hit your thumb, what do you do? Yeah, you say out. Hopefully you don't cuss. Who said cuss? All right, we're, we're going to talk to you later. Little tiny piece of your body, right? I don't even know uh, proportionally what it represents, but it's small. What do you do? You, you scream out, your whole body goes into protect your thumb mode. Some of you start sucking. <laughs> You revert back to babyhood. Some of you do the dance, you know, the my thumb hurt, hurts dance. What, what's amazing about God is the healing begins immediately. And as the days and the weeks go by, you know, he's created this amazing healing process. If you're a month down the road or three months down the road and you're still holding and sucking and dancing, there's a serious problem, Right? In, in a sense, emotionally, it's no different. You know, the seductiveness of pain, some of us have gone through an event. Some of us have gone through some trauma. And here we are, we've turned inward, and we've stayed there, and it's hindered the healing hand of God in our life. Step number one to healing is blessing God, praising God. Listen, blessing Him before the pain, blessing Him in the pain and blessing him after the pain. This was Job's response. You remember the story of Job? I mean, by the time you get out of chapter two, the guy has lost it all. He's lost his family. He's lost his position in society. He has lost all of his possessions. He's lost his physical health. The only thing he didn't lose was his wife, who... <laughs> Who said to him, just curse God and die? And I don't know if he prayed, you know what, God, you took everything else. <laughs> no, I'm giving her a hard time. She, she was struggling too. But you, you know, the devil came to God and he said, the only reason this guy worships you is because you've, you bless him. That's the only reason he worships you. God said, all that he has is in your hand except his life. 
and all of his possessions were taken away in one moment, and his family. Satan comes back and says, the only reason this guy worships you is because he has physical health. Skin for skin, all that a man has, he will give for his own life. And so his physical health is afflicted. And the Bible says in all of that, this was Job's response. Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord is taken away. Do you remember how the rest of that verse goes? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Can you say that this morning? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job, in the midst of pain, was able to praise God. Let me tell you why. Because he had prepared his heart. Job had spent the time preparing his heart. He had been building a foundation. He knew his God. You know, we deal with a lot of suffering in people's lives. And sometimes when we're walking through um, trauma with people, sometimes I look at what they're going through and I think, God, you know what? I don't know how I would respond. I mean, so intense, so seemingly devastating that, that sometimes I look at what they're going through and I think, God, you know what? I don't know how I would respond. Be because the truth is, none of us knows. None of us knows exactly how we would respond until we are in that situation ourselves. And while that may be true, I may not know how I would respond. I know that I can be preparing my heart now so no matter what comes my way, when I'm there in that moment, I will be praising God. He had built a history of knowing God. He knew the Lord. Listen, if you're a fair-weather friend of God, if you're half-hearted about your Christianity, if your approach to the Bible and to God is like it's a celestial salad bar and you're picking what you choose, you like this, you don't like this, you like this, you don't like this, the minute God allows something that you don't like in your life, you're going to have a problem. You're going to have a problem. You and I need to be preparing our heart. That means we need to be knowing our God. That means that we need to be able to, in the midst of suffering, lift our hands and our hearts in praise. Today you've come into this place, some of you are dealing with some heavy stuff. Some of you just have stress and you're under pressure and there's a lot happening in your life. Maybe it's not severe trauma, but still, there's a lot going on. I want to encourage you today to lift your voice to the Lord. Sing to Him. I want to encourage you today to lift your hands to him. Now, some of you, you come here, you got a very conservative background, and you see people raising their hands, and you're thinking, I came to a Pentecostal church. What's, what's this all about? Well, raising your hands to God is biblical. We're encouraged to do it in the book of Psalms. And this really is what it reflects. God, I'm surrendering my life to you. It's, it's going from this to this. Today, do you want the healing of God? Today, do you want to be set free? Today, do you want the cords broken, the prison doors open? Today, do you want to begin that pathway of healing? It all starts with praising God. And oftentimes, the most important time to praise God is when we don't feel like it. So, my brothers and sisters, number one, bless Him. Number two, God is big when we look to Him. Notice he says this as we just work our way through these verses. He is the Father. This is the second half of verse 3. He is the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He is the Father of mercies and He is the God of all comfort. When Paul says mercy, he's talking about relief. God is the source of relief. Now, certainly when you're going through something difficult, Oftentimes, the first prayer is, God, relieve me of these circumstances. And you know, as you pray to God, and I know this is true in my life, there are times, there are times that God deals with the circumstances of our life, and he brings us relief circumstantially. But that doesn't happen all the time. Paul really here is not just talking about a relief from circumstances. He's talking about inward relief. He's talking about the mercy of God being experienced in the inward parts first. And we know that when we look to God, he brings that for sure. He is the Father. He is the source of mercy. He is the God of all comfort. Now, when the Bible talks about the comfort of God, it's not talking about comfort in the world's sense of comfort. You know what the world says. Hey, do you want a break? Hey, do you want relief? Hey, do you want some sort of comfort? Then buy some southern comfort. That's the world's, 
That's the world's way of, of dealing with it. Hey, do you want a break? Little escapism. Throw this movie in. Listen to this music. Take a drive to Colorado where they, they've legalized pot. There's your, there's your experience of relief. Now, before I was a believer, this was my path for comfort. You know, I would choose those different avenues, those worldly things that were offered to find some sense of escape or relief. Now, this is the problem. You guys know that's a dead-end road. You know that the next morning when you wake up, what you've done is you've gone full circle and you're right back to the point where you began. And listen, you're worse off because now you're all messed up on the inside. You know, some of you maybe have been looking to the things of this world. The world has this lie that says that your comfort, your relief uh, from the circumstances, from the pressure, from the stress, take this shot, smoke this thing, watch this movie, engage in this type of behavior. And I'm telling you, behind that is a lie from the devil because he wants to destroy your life. Those things will leave you empty. Those things will leave you broken. And that sin, which is what it is, it is an offense to God, that sin will not only damage you, it will damage the people that you love the most. None of those things bring comfort. None of those things bring comfort. God is the God of all comfort. That word means he is the source of strength. He is the source of healing. He is the one who brings hope. He consoles. That means he comes alongside and he calms your heart. He soothes you. He supports you. There is nothing like the comfort of God. Are you receiving his strength? Are you in a place where you're uh, receiving his healing and his hope? Have you allowed him to come alongside of your life, to calm you, to soothe you, to bring his support in the midst of your storm? Maybe the circumstances aren't going to change, but you know what? God wants to change you and me on the inside. I love the story of the disciples. You know, they were in the boat. They were on their way to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and there was a, a man who was possessed by legion on the other side. Jesus said, let's get on the boat. Let's go to the other side. On the way. On the way. You know how the story goes. On the way, the wind is raging. It's buffeting the, the little bark. Uh, the, the wave is overflowing the boat. Literally, there's water that's filling the boat. The disciples are freaked out. They're concerned for their life. They go to Jesus. What's Jesus doing? He's sleeping. He's at peace. He's at rest. He knows where the boat's going to end up. And they wake him up and they say, Lord, don't you care? Don't you even care that we're perishing? And you remember how the story goes. He stands up in the boat. He rebukes the wind. He rebukes the wave. The sea is placid. They say, who is this that even the wind and the wave obey him? And they fall and worship him. He rebukes them and says, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Doubt what? Doubt the promise that he was going to get them from one side to the other regardless of the storm. Listen, God may not change the circumstances in your life. God may not say to your circumstances, peace be still, but he can say to your heart today, peace be still. All of this, that's right. But listen, all this means that you've got to be going to him. You've got to be looking to him. People come to me, Pastor, man, my life is just upside down. It's crazy. Let me tell you, this has happened, that has happened, this has happened. Dude, man, that's rough. How's your time with the Lord? I don't have time for that. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you don't have time not to have time. You're all stressed out. You're all anxious because you're not going to the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort. Paul, later on in this epistle, he's going to be talking about his suffering, and he says this very thing, and this is how he says it. While they were in the midst of suffering, he says, we were perplexed, but not despairing. We were persecuted, but not forsaken. We were struck down, but not destroyed. We were hard-pressed, but not crushed. I like that. We were hard-pressed. This is what he was saying. From every single angle, there was pressure on our lives. You ever been in that place? where it feels like from every single angle there's pressure on your life and you pray to God, you know what, God, I can't. You ever prayed this prayer? God, I can't take one more thing. 
And what does God do? He gives you one more thing. And then you pray, God, I can't take one more, one more thing. And what does he do? He gives you one more thing because God knows. God, and look, it, it's not about what you can handle. Some, some people say, hey, God knows what you can handle. That's not the point. The point is to get you to a place where you understand you can't handle anything apart from him. That's, that's the point. That's the point. And so he's in it, right? He's in the midst of all of it. And he says, man, we were hard pressed, but not crushed. Even though there was all this pressure, all this stress, there was something in him that was sustaining him. Later on, you can uh, do this little experiment at home. You know it intuitively when I say it anyway, so. But think about it like this. If you take a bottle of water, it's got the cap on it, it's filled, and you take it in your hand and squeeze it as hard as you can, what happens? Nothing, right? Unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger or something like that. If you take that same bottle, take the cap off, pour the contents out, and take it in your hand and squeeze it, what happens? You crush it, all right? The, the bottle is able to withstand the pressure because of what's in it. And this is what Paul is saying. We were able to, to handle the pressure of life. We were sustained because of what was in us or who was in us. It was because he was filled with the mercies and the comfort of God. And this is what God says. The more we suffer, the more he comforts. The more you suffer, the more tribulation you go through. This is God's math. Most of us aren't claiming this in Jesus' name, but this is God's math. The more you go through, the more he comforts you. Now, I'm not saying we therefore pray, God, afflict my life. Please, God, I want to experience your comfort, so put me through tribulation. Now, if you're praying that, you're a very sick person. <laughs> God, God knows what he's going to do in your life. What we do know is that when we're in the middle of it, God's strength is sufficient. The more we suffer, the greater his presence is. I love the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, their Hebrew names, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And there they were, uh, exiles in Babylon, living their lives in a godly way. God was doing great things in their life, living under a very corrupt man. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. He was a very prideful king. In fact, he had just uh, made an idol to himself. I mean, this is how prideful he was. He just made an idol to himself. Uh, it was made of solid gold. And this is what he had done in his whole kingdom. When the band would play their music, everybody was supposed to bow down and worship this idol. Now, this is a problem for these little Hebrew guys because they've been taught, uh, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no graven images of me or of anything else, and you will not bow down to them. So here they are, lovers of God, in a very corrupt situation, being compelled. Everybody's bowing, and they're standing. And they stood out like a sore thumb. The leadership went, got these guys, brought them before Nebuchadnezzar, and said, hey, uh, Nebi, when the music plays, these guys aren't bowing. The Bible says he was filled with fury and with rage, and he tried to compel them. And this is what they said to him. They said to him, look it, uh, no matter what you do, this is my paraphrase, no matter what you do, we will not bow. We're trusting in God. And whether he delivers us, whether he chooses to deliver us or not, we will never bow to that idol. He is filled with rage at these little uh, exiles who are upstarts, has a furnace heated seven times its original uh, temperature, and then takes these three and throws them into the furnace. You guys remember the story? You remember what happened? So he's thinking he's done with them, and uh, the, some of the guys come, and they say, dude, we got a problem. I mean, they probably didn't call him dude, but they said, dude, we got a problem. Those boys aren't dead. So he goes over and he looks in, and he said, hey, uh, didn't we, I can count, even though I went to public school, we, I can count, and didn't we, <laughs> didn't we, sorry. Sorry, that was bad. I know I'm going to get an email for that. So sorry about that. Didn't we throw three into the fire? Why do I see four? And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. And those guys are in the fire, and they're walking, and they're not bound anymore. So I want you to imagine that they get pulled out, 
and obviously they are ministering to Nebuchadnezzar, but this is what happens in the midst of our trial. He is with us. He is with us. Those young guys walking, how cool would that have been to be walking in the midst of a fiery furnace, hanging out with, with Christ, having your uh, bonds burnt away, the power of Christ so present there, they didn't even smell like smoke, their clothes weren't singed. This is what God does for you and for me in the midst of the trial. He is with us. He takes those things that bind us and he burns them away. We come through and are on the other side and we don't even have the smell of smoke on us because of the presence of Christ. When you're going through it, maybe some of you are going through it today, he is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Can you imagine those guys looking back on that incident personally and, and reminding themselves? You know, maybe they went through other trials and difficulties and they looked back on that moment and said, you know what, Lord, you were with me then. You were with me in the midst of that trial. I'm gonna trust you in this trial. Can you imagine if they had the opportunity to encourage somebody else who came to them maybe struggling or suffering and they were able to say, you know what, he was with me. Let me tell you my story. We were thrown into a furnace and he was with me and he delivered me and he was faithful to me. This is what God wants to do in our life. He is big when we look to him and listen, he is big when we help other people. He is big when we help other people. I don't know if you're a Tozer fan, but I love this quote from A.W. Tozer. He said this, it's doubtful God can use a man or a woman greatly until he is hurt him or her deeply. Let me just say it again. It is doubtful God can use a man or woman greatly until he has hurt him or her deeply. Paul relates this principle, and I want you to see what it says in verse 4, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So look, you're in the middle of it. Or maybe you're not, I'm telling you, you will be because that's just the way life works. God is big when we bless him. God is big when we look to him. And God is big when we help other people. God wants to take you in the midst of your suffering, pour his comfort out into your life so that you can come alongside those who are suffering and be a source of comfort to them. You know, this word uh, was the same word in the original language that Jesus used of the Holy Spirit in John 16. Remember, he talked about the promise of the coming comforter. The word is paraclete. So in a way, you can have a ministry that is like the Holy Spirit. Notice I did not say today, you are the Holy Spirit, okay? Just in case you were wondering today, some people believe that it's their role to be the Holy Spirit in other people's lives. No, that's not your spiritual gift, but God does want to use you in a similar way. God wants to use your suffering and he wants to use the comfort that he's poured out into your life so you can come alongside of other people and be a source of strength, be a source of healing, be a source of hope, be a source of support. When you go through difficulty yourself, you're able to have compassion on people. You know, instead of sometimes looking judgmentally or critically or looking down your nose at somebody who's going through something, you know from your own experience how difficult life can be. And as God comforts you in your circumstance and scenario, now you can come alongside of somebody with an attitude of humility and compassion and give them what God has given to you. Now, there are people who have said to me over the years, Pastor, you know what? To really be able to comfort somebody, you have to go through exactly what they've gone through. Um, I don't believe that that's what the Bible teaches. I'm not saying that can't be helpful, helpful from time to time, but this is what I believe the Bible says. The Bible says that it's not the specific circumstances that are used in helping other people. It is the comfort of God that we get in the midst of them that we share with other people. 
So I come alongside and say, listen, you know, I know you're struggling. I'm here for you. I'm your brother in Christ. I love you so much. My circumstances were a little bit different. This is what they were. But let me tell you what God did in my life. Let me tell you how God helped me. Let me tell you how he comforted me. Let me tell you how he poured his mercy out in my life. Let me tell you how he strengthened me. Let me tell you how he picked me up out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock. And though our circumstances may be different, our God is not. And what he did in my life, he can do in your life too. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be at a place in your life where you're, where you're willing to pray this prayer to God this week, all right, this week? You know, this presupposes that you and I are handling the situations of our life God's way. But I want to encourage you this week to pray this prayer to God. God, I pray to you, please, use the suffering that I've experienced in my life and the comfort that you've poured out in my life to come alongside of someone who is hurting and, and in need so I can direct them to you. Are you willing to pray that this week? You know, to be at a place where, where you're willing to take the suffering and the tribulation and the affliction and the pain and step outside or beyond yourself and allow God to use it to benefit somebody else. One of the greatest ways you can get yourself out of the pit of self-despair is to help another person in need. So he is big when we help others. He is big when we trust him. I want you to check out verse 9 real quick. It says this, Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. So God is big. Listen now. God is big when you and I trust in him. God is big when you and I place our confidence in him and in him alone. I've walked with the Lord for over 22 years. I know for some of you that seems like a lot. For some of you it seems like a little. But I can tell you, uh, having walked with the Lord for 22 years, he has never failed me once. He has never failed me once. Now, I'm telling you, he's worked things out differently than I thought he would many times. You know, there are times where I thought I had God forecasted, figured out. I had an idea of what I thought he was going to do. And the very moment I began to think those things, you know what God did? He did it a totally different way. He's mysterious. His ways are beyond us finding out or searching out. You know, God is God, and so he does things however he desires to do them. I've had people come to me and say, you know what, Pastor, what are you going to do? Trust in God for the rest of your life? Yeah. Yes, absolutely I am. They say, hey, that's blind faith, man. That's like taking a step in the darkness. And I say, no, it's like taking a step in the light. We have the light of the word. We have the light of his character. We have the light of his faithfulness in our lives. And so we can take a step forward, regardless of the situation, regardless of whether or not he has answered the whys in our life. I want to remind you this morning that we worship a who, not a why. Some of us today you know, we're struggling with unanswered whys in our life. We've gone through some very difficult circumstances, and here we are, we've, we've got these questions for God. God, why have you allowed this? God, why have you caused this? God, why did things work out like this? And it's, the, it's become in our life the idolatry of why. We can't even move forward in our walk with him because we are stuck here. My brothers and sisters, this is the truth. God may never answer the why. He never answered it for Job, and the fact of the matter is he may not answer it for you. But I want to tell you something, and I don't mean this in a harsh way, but he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to because he's God. And whether he chooses to or not, you and I worship him not because of an answer that he gives, but because of who he is. Will you lay that why down that has been hindering you from his healing hand? Will you lay down that unanswered question that has become an obsession in your life that you can't get past? Will you lay that, 
that question down that has been burdening you so that you can experience the healing hand of God in your life and so that the things you've gone through can be used to help other people. If you want the fullness, if you want the fullness of God to be poured through your life, you're going to have to pull the curtain of why back. You're going to have to allow God to open up the blinds. You're going to have to trust in him. You're going to have to be willing to say, you know what, God, I don't understand. I don't understand why this happened. I don't understand why you've allowed it, but this I know. I know whom I've believed. I know whom I've believed, and I am confident that you, God, are e able to keep that which I've committed to you. It's not about what. It's not about why. Today, it's about, it's about whom. Maybe here you are today and you know your heart is burdened and you've been afflicted and you're in the midst of pain maybe you've experienced betrayal in relationships maybe you've had a spouse betray you or kids betray you or friends betray you or a church people in the church betray you and you can't get you won't get your eyes off of those people it's not about them it's about you having your confidence in god will you set your eyes on the god who will never fail you he will never falter today will you yield will you yield that suffering and that pain to him no matter what it may be i had a lady come to me last night and after this message she said pastor she's struggling and she said i'm I'm overwhelmed. She said, I was abused my whole early childhood by, by my stepfather. Everybody now in my family has died. He is the only one left living, and now I have to take care of him. Pastor, why has this happened to me? And I said, I don't have the answer to why, but let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about whom. Let me tell you about what God can do in your life. And I'm not saying that these steps are easy, but I am saying to you that he is faithful. If you will cling to him and hold on to him and trust him, he will faithfully guide you through this situation. And my brothers and sisters, he will faithfully guide you through every situation. And so let's bless him. Let's praise him. Let's praise him before it comes. Let's praise him when it's coming. Let's praise him after it's over. Let's look to him for all things, drawing near and receiving his mercy and his comfort. Let's allow him to take our pain and suffering and the comfort he's poured into our lives and use it to help somebody else. And let's put our full, complete confidence in him who will never fail us and never falter. Big God. Do you have a big God? Yes. All right. Let's pray. Father, we love you, God. You're an amazing, amazing God, far greater, far more magnificent than I think we even understand. But this is the desire of our heart, God, as a church, where we're saying to you, God, we want to experience the fullness of your glory, God. We want to know your greatness. God, we want our lives to be windows through which you pour forth your magnificence in this dark world so that people can see how good you truly are. Father, we love you. We bless your name. We thank you today for your word. This morning, as we're in an attitude of prayer, maybe today you're here, you've never put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Here you are in church, however you got here. Maybe a friend brought you, maybe you checked us out online, maybe you've been coming week after week, but you've never taken that step of faith. You've never really believed in Jesus and the sacrifice that he made on the cross for you in his resurrection. You've never been born again. You've never yielded your life to him as Lord. You've never confessed and repented of your sin. Look at this is the good news. The good news is not that you can make your way to God by your good works. The good news is that God did the work for you. That God delivered up his own son who died on a cross as a sacrifice, a substitution for your sin. That means that Jesus took the wrath and the justice that you deserve to take from God. He took it upon himself. God so loved the world that he delivered up, he gave his only begotten son. 
and it was a perfect sacrifice, full and complete. And God acknowledged its sufficiency by raising up Jesus from the dead on the third day. And this is the good news. If you believe in him, if you humble your heart, confess to God that you've sinned against him and receive Christ as your Savior and as your Lord, the Bible says you will be made a child of God, you will be given the gift of everlasting life, you will be forgiven of your sins, you will receive the mercies and the comfort of God. Do you need him today? Are you struggling today? You need the help of God in your life? Will you humble yourself and lay down your pride and let God do what he's been desiring to do in you? This is you this morning. If God is speaking to your heart, listen, I want to pray for you. You have a step of faith to take. You need to experience the bigness and the greatness of God in your life. Right where you're sitting today, if this is you, you want the Lord Jesus in your life. You want the forgiveness of sins. You want to take a step forward. You want to experience God. You need his help. Right where you're sitting today, I, want, I just want you to raise your hand. I want to see who you are. You say, Pastor, that's me. I want the Lord in my life. God bless you, and God bless you. God bless the both of you here in the center. God bless you, sir. Thank you for raising your hand. He loves you so much. I see your hand over on the left, and I see your hand on the left in the back. This is you today. Don't say no to God. He's got a blessing for you today. Would you raise your hand? I want to see who you are this morning. You just get that hand up high. I see you. Praise the Lord. God bless you. He loves you guys so much. I see your hands. If you're in the overflow this morning, I want you to raise your hands uh, over in the overflow. Our elders want to acknowledge you. Just one more moment. If there's anybody else, you just slip that hand up today. I want to see who you are. God bless you. Thank you for raising your hand. God is so good. He's doing something in lives today. He's touching your life. Respond to him today. Maybe today you're a, a backslidden Christian. You put your trust and faith in the Lord sometime in the past, but you've gone back to the world, maybe for a source of comfort, and you're not walking with God. Listen, he's never taken his eyes off of you. He loves you. Today he's brought you to this place so you can turn your life back to him. Is this you this morning? If if this is you, you're prodigal. Brother or sister, you're prodigal. You've been running from God. Maybe you've been thinking, man, I'm so far gone, he could never receive me back. That is not true. You need to take one step back into his presence today. If this is you, I want to pray for you as well. I want you to raise your hand this morning. God bless you. I see your hands. God bless you. Loves you guys. Anybody else I want to pray for you? Get that hand up high. All right, Father, we love you, God. We thank you so much for the work of your spirit in this place. Pray, God, please now you grant these precious ones the strength and courage to take this step of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, hey, I'm going to ask you guys, please, no movement in the sanctuary today. This is the most important part of our service. If you raise your hand today, either to receive Christ or recommit your life to him, I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. It's a prayer of repentance. The word repent simply means this. You're going to be confessing to God that you've sinned against him. And you're going to be turning away from that sin in your life. It's a prayer of trust and faith. You're going to be confessing to him that you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, his son. You believe that Jesus died for you and that he rose on the third day. And God says this. He says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God is going to do an amazing work in your life. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he called all of them publicly publicly. He said to Matthew, while, Matthew while, at his, while he was at his tax collecting table, he said, Matthew, follow me. The Bible says Matthew got up. He publicly identified himself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Dennis is going to lead us in a song this morning. For all of you that raised your hand, I'm going to call you publicly. Listen, it's a privilege to identify yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to embarrass you today, but this is one of the greatest privileges you will have in your life. If you raise your hand, I want you to stand up. Come forward this morning. I want to lead you in this prayer. If you raise your hand right now, stand up and come on forward. Who I want to lead you in this prayer. He? He's the mightiest of all. Who is he? Creation trembles at his call. Who is he? He's a lonely sacrifice. You pay the victim's price. His name is Jesus. Who is he? But the power that none can tame. Who is he? That every foe would fear his name. Who is he? He was 
humbly led away to suffer that dark day. His name is Jesus. If there's anybody else this morning, if God is speaking to your heart, I, I just want you to think about this. Seven billion people on the face of planet Earth, and God has spoken to you this morning. He loves you. Whatever you're holding on to that is holding you back, I'm telling you, it is not worth it. Maybe today you're thinking, well, I'll make this decision next week or next month or next year. You don't know. You don't, you're not even promised tomorrow. No, today is the day of salvation. Right here, right now, God wants to bless your life. Don't say no to God. Let him do what he desires to do in you today. Receive his blessings. If there's anybody else this morning, we're going to give you a moment before I pray with these here. If there's anybody else this morning, right now, I want you to stand up. You might be in the middle of a row worried about what other people are going to think or having to get out of your way. Don't worry about that. Maybe you're nervous about coming down. Grab the hand of the person next to you. They'll come down with you. One more moment. If this is you, stand up right now and come forward. Who is he? With the eyes that burn like fire Who is he? Ah, oh, the wonder he inspires Who is he? He bore our guilt and shame For the one who's gone astray His name is Jesus Jesus He's the Father's own right hand Son of God and Son of Man, Jesus, well, He died and rose again, Jesus, He's a Lion and the Lamb. All right, I'm going to lead you guys in prayer this morning. I'm so blessed with what God is doing in your life. This prayer is not to me, it's not to this church. It is to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. He is going to hear and He's going to do great things in your life. Let's bow our heads together. And I'd like you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Dear God, today I give you my life. I confess that I've sinned against you. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your son. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose on the third day. And I believe that through him, you have forgiven me of my sins. You've made me your child. You've given me the gift of everlasting life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Pour your glory through my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, you guys. Awesome. Man, we're so excited for you guys. May God richly bless you. Let's praise him. Blessing to have Dennis today, amen. Let's give him praise.